Thank you, Anders, for the wonderful introduction. Hi, everyone. Before I start my presentation, I would like to make sure that everybody can hear me or not. So if you can, please say yes in the chat box. So let me check. Great. So I see a lot of you saying yes. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for joining today's webinar with us. I'm very happy and excited to have you all to join us. And even though this is a webinar, I hope it can be as interactive as possible. So during my presentation, please feel free to share your ideas or ask questions. But I'm not very good at multitasking, so I will answer your questions at the end of the presentation, all right? So the title of my presentation is Flipping the Classroom, the Road TED and Technology Can Play to Get Students Speaking. So let me start my presentation by showing you a picture. So I believe this is the ideal classroom that most teachers are hoping for, right? So when we ask the questions, all oh, the students are very excited and they wanted to share their thoughts with us. But however, in reality, most of the classes will be like this. The students are very quiet. So they may pay attention to what we say to them, but they may not necessarily want to participate in the discussion. So when our students are so quiet in the class, we need to think about what are the reasons? Is that because the way we teach or is that because students may have some difficulties? So I would like to share a research finding with you. According to Cloud, teacher talk is dominant in most of the class time, and student talk is less dominant. And because of that, students actually have very limited opportunity to practice their language. And also because teachers want to check students' understanding, so teachers are more inclined to ask information recall questions. However, this type of question may restrict students' opportunity to, pr to produce more complex uh, language or even restrict them to produce more and practice uh, complex thinking skills. So do you agree with this research finding or not? So please let me know and type in the, your answer in the chat box. Yeah, so a lot of you saying yes. So no matter whether your answer is yes or no, but uh, I believe most of us still want that we can find an effective approach to help our students to be able to practice like, their language more in the class, right? So that's why in the beginning of my presentation, I'm going to introduce you a flipped learning approach. And uh, I'm going to show you how to use this approach to promote discussion and learner autonomy. So how can we use this approach to help students to take more responsibility of their own learning? And then I, we will discuss what are some factors that hinder students' overproductions. So what are some difficulties that our students may have? So they are not be able to uh, share more in the class. And then after knowing the difficulties that our students may have, then I will share with you what are some solutions to overcome these difficulties. And by doing so, we can help them to improve their speaking. And lastly, uh, I will share how to design engaging speaking activities. We will discuss about seven criteria when you design a speaking activity and make your speaking activity more effectively. So let's start with the first one, the flipped learning approach. And I would like to talk about what is flipped learning and why should we adopt this approach and how to implement this approach. So let me start with what. So I believe a lot of you must heard of this term, flipped learning. So when you heard of this term, what came to your mind? Is it like this? So, of course not, right? So for the real class flip classroom, it is not like this. Then what exactly a flip classroom should be like? Should be like? 
So let's find out the answer by doing a poll. So what is flipped learning? I give you four choices. So please take a look at these four choices and choose one that you think can best describe flipped learning. So Anders, we may need your help with the poll. So I see a lot of you choose a lot of you chose number four. So if you can please click your answer on the poll, that would be great. So we can see everybody's result. Thank you for doing that. Wow, so I see a lot of you chose number four and some of you chose number three. Okay. Great, so we have five more seconds to do that. Okay, so let's check out the results together. So a lot of you chose number four and congratulations, you got this question correct. So this is the definition from John Bergerman. And John Bergerman is one of the initiatives of flipped learning. So let me, so let me use a picture to show you and to tell you what flipped flip learning is and to help you better understand what it is. But before that, let me explain to you. Flipped learning is not blended learning because for blended learning, it requires high tech. But for flipped learning, it is not necessary. So you can either use high tech or not. So if you can use high tech, it is going to helpful for you to flip their classroom. That is great. But if you don't want to use high tech, it is also fine with the flip learning approach. So now let me use this picture to help you understand what flip learning is. So on the left of the slide, this part, on the left of the slide, you will see this is a traditional classroom. So students come to the class and teachers start to deliver the lesson, deliver the lecture, and students can start to learn the new concept through the lecture. And then after that, they go back home and they start to do their homework. But for their homework, some of the questions may need them to use their higher order thinking skills, such as problem solving or to analyze but some students may have difficulties doing these kind of activities by themselves. However, for the flipped classroom, it is very different. So before coming to the before coming to the class, students are going to learn the lecture by themselves. So they can either watch a video or do a reading. So they are able to have some basic understanding of the new concept. So they are prepared and they, they come to the classroom. Since they already have some basic understanding of the new concept, so for the teachers, they can have more time to do uh, activities that require students higher order thinking skills. And teachers can have time to guide students to do more discussions. As teacher, the role of teacher will be very different. For a flipped classroom, Teachers are more like a facilitator, so they are there to help students to to engage in discussion or to fulfill some difficult, difficult activities. So you can see that for the traditional classroom, it is more teacher centered. However, for the flipped classroom, it is more student centered. OK, so after understanding what flipped learning is, so let's move on to talk about why should we adopt this approach? What are the benefits to use this approach? So as you can see, because of the nature of flipped learning, students need to take more responsibility of their own learning. They need to be prepared before coming to the class. If they don't do that, um, they may have they won't be able to participate in the in class. So that's why, first of all, we are helping them to promote their learner autonomy. And also, we are shifting their roles from passive learners to active learners. And according to research, if active learning is the key to help students to improve their academic performance. And students will do much better if they can actively participate in their own learning. 
And because when students, before they come to the class, they already uh, gain some basic understanding of the topic or of the concept. So during the class time, teachers could guide them to have more discussions. So students will have more chances to practice their language or they can have more time to do some higher order thinking activities together. And by doing so, we can help students to deepen their learning. So you can see there are many benefits of using this approach. Then here comes the next question. So how to implement this approach? So I'm going to introduce you four steps to implement this approach. So the first step is that before coming to the class, students need to do self-study. And then comes to the second step. Students need to finish the activities that the teachers assigned them to do before coming to the next class. So after the first and the second step, students are prepared for the upcoming class. So for the third one, for this step, teachers need to make sure they are going to provide them with, a, with some higher order thinking activities so they will have chance to practice their critical thinking and or they can have a lot of discussions. And after that, here comes the last step. So teachers will give students feedback based on their performance for their activities. So I'm going to explain to you each step with details. So let me start with the first one, the self-study. So this is a very important step. And this is one of the key elements to make sure that you can make your flipped classroom successful. So the key element is that before student comes to the class, you need to make sure students have the opportunity to gain first exposure to course content before coming to the class. So let me use my own class as an example. So my students and I were working on this unit, free time. So we just finished this unit and I wanted them to go deeper this unit and I also wanted them to practice their speaking. So I chose a TED Talk for them. And the reason why I chose this TED Talk is that first of all, it was related to the topic we were discussing and secondly, it was appropriate for my students' uh, proficiency level. And also, I want my students to practice their speaking. And TED Talks are excellent modeling for them. The speakers are experts at public speaking. So by doing so, I hope my students can have a great modeling for these. Uh, so the talks are great modeling for my students. And then, as you all know that, like TED Talk has a lot of a lot of powerful ideas. I want, I hope that my students would be motivated by these ideas, and then they would be more willing to share their thoughts in the class. And also, I use this TED Talk as a supplement, not the main curriculum. So when I use it, actually my students didn't think it was stressful, and they found it was quite interesting. And after finish this first step, then it's time to move to the second step. So the students need to do the assigned activities. However, do you think if we ask them to do some activities before coming to the class, will they just do it? So probably some of them will do it and some of them may not do that. So what can we do to make sure our students finish this activity before coming to the class? So one of the way is that you need to provide an incentive for your students to prepare for the class. So an incentive could be the points. So when I was studying at Columbia University, my professor always assigned me a lot of uh, assignments before coming to the class. And she provided points as an incentive. So to get those points, I worked so hard to try to get those points. So even though I was very busy at that time, I still finished all the assigned activities. 
So did you see the logic? So in order to earn the points, so students will try to finish the activities and then they are prepared for the class. So now I use this in my, my own class and it still works very well this my, for my students. Then you may start to wonder then what are some possible activities could be. So it could be either quizzes, writing assignments or online practice. So for me, remember that my students watch a TED talk, right? So I use this app. This app is called Learn English with TED Talk. I have them to use this app to do some online practice. So let me show you what kind of practice did they do. Even though the talk was appropriate for my students' English proficiency, they still need some, needed some support before watching the video. So the app provides some language supports. So they could do some vocabulary practice and they can also learn some communication skill before watch the TED talk. So after they got sufficient language support, then they started to watch the TED talk. And after watch the TED talk, I wanted my students to do some language practice. So these are the online practice they, they did. So first of all, I could check their understanding, as you can see the first one. And also, I asked them to do some vocabulary exercise and grammar exercise. And you can see it is very easy for me to monitor their progress. So for the grammar practice, you can see this one. Did you see all the yellow boxes? It means that my students finish all the activities. But if you see this one, the speaking practice. Did you see there are two boxes marked in gray? It means that my students didn't finish this activity. So it is quite it was quite easy for me to monitor their progress. So even though students practice English at home, they still can receive instant feedback. So when they answer a question wrong, and then the app will prompt them. Are you sure? Or when the students got the question correct, and then the app will offer them uh, positive feedback. So I use my own class as, a, as an example to show you how to implement the first and the second uh, step. So now we're going to move on to the third step. But before that, I would like to show you and also summarize what we are now. So for the agenda today, we are going to cover four major points, right? So we have already finished the first point. We talk about what flipped learning is and what are the benefits of flipped learning. And I also share with you to implement this approach. It, take, it needs four steps. So now I'm going to continue discussing how to implement the third step. And at the same time, I will also finish covering the rest of the main point for today's presentation. So let's start with the second one, factors which hinder oral production. So let's do a chat box poll together. I really want to hear from you. So what are some challenges students have while expressing the, their ideas in the classroom? So please share your ideas with me and type your answer in the chat box. I'm very curious what you're going to say. So they are afraid to make a mistake totally. They don't have vocabulary, so true. And uh, they are so shy or anxious. And uh, so I see a lot of interesting answers and a lot of them. So you agree with each other a lot. That's great. Okay, so we will have five more seconds to do that. Hmm. Interesting. So a lot of you believe vocabulary is the key. Okay, or because they don't feel secure enough or because of shyness. Okay, great. So let's take a look at what researchers say about the challenges that our students have when they express themselves. So according to Cloud, 
she listed five challenges in her book. So the, for the first challenge actually is the most common one, that students don't understand what is being said or asked of them. So of course, when students don't understand what we say to them, for sure, they cannot participate in the discussion. So in order to fix this, we can provide them with comprehensible input. So later I will show you how to provide comprehensible input. And let's move on to the second challenge. A lot of you mentioned about this one. Students don't have enough vocabulary or phrasing to express a specific idea. So to deal with this challenge, what we can do is that we can provide them with language tools. And there are three kinds of language tools. And later I will share with you and I will talk about them more. And for the third challenge it is also very common is that students don't have enough background knowledge. So they, when they come to the class and the teacher asks them this question, they don't know how to answer. Therefore, the flipped learning approach will be really helpful. Remember that before coming to the class, students need to do some self-study and even finish some activities so they are prepared. So when teachers ask them questions, they will have some background knowledge and help them to answer the questions. And for the first challenge, a lot of you also mentioned about this one. So students feel insecure about speaking because after all, they are, they are going to express themselves in L2. And they may worry that their classmate will make fun of them because of their accent, or they may not sound smart enough when they express themselves in L2. So in order to deal with this challenge, I suggest that we can try to create a welcoming and encouraging classroom environment so students will feel comfortable about sharing their thoughts in class. And now let's come to the last challenge. Students may, they don't understand the underlying discussion expectations. So they don't, some of them don't know like when they could join the discussion, when is a good timing to jump in the discussion, or they don't know like what will be appropriate speaking time. Um, let me use, uh, let me give you an example. So when I was teaching at the language center at Teachers College, Columbia University, and I work with a beginner ESO class, and I love this class a lot, and uh, my students all work so hard. But I noticed my Japanese students, they were very really quiet. They didn't speak a lot in my class. However, my students from South America, they share a lot. So after the class, I came to them and asked them, asked the Japanese students, why you didn't share a lot in the class? And they told me that because they thought they needed to wait until I call upon them then they were allowed to share their ideas. And I say, no, please, please jump into the discussion whenever you feel like to. So after that, in the beginning of every class, I always tell the students what are some common discussion expectations. And when you tell them about that, and they will know, okay, what do you expect them to do in class? Okay, so we finished dealing, we finished talking about all the challenges and some possible ways to deal with this challenge. So now let me start with the first one and give you more details. If our students don't understand us, of course they cannot participate in the discussion. So what are the solutions for this one? So we can provide them with visual scaffolds to help them to make these complex ideas become understandable. So there are many kinds of visual scaffolds, such as pictures, realia, charts, maps, and graphic organizer. I am a big fan of graphic organizers. I love using them. So let me give you one of the example of graphic organizer. So, a graphic organizer can help students learn how to organize and express their thoughts. So it's going to be really helpful for them. 
So remember, to help your students to understand what you say, you can try to provide them with some visual scaffolds. Then let's move on to the second challenge. So students, a lot of you mentioned that students don't have enough vocabulary to express themselves. So as teachers, how can we help them? So first of all, we can provide them with some language tools. There are three types of language tools. The first one is language forms. So we can help them to work on vocabulary and grammar. So remember that I had my students watch the TED Talk. So I also use this presentation tool. And uh, this tool, it has some vocabulary and grammatical structure that are related to the TED Talk. So in class, I use this presentation tool to help my students to build on their vocabulary. And the second tool is language functions. Please, this is a very important tool. So think about you can probably help your students with this one. So language functions are reasons for using language, such as compare and contrast, agree and disagree, retell and describe. And usually specific grammatical structures and vocabulary words are used for a language function. So when you teach a language function, you can try to also teach the vocabulary words and the grammatical structures that are associated with this language function. So let me give you the presentation. Uh, sorry, let me give you uh, an example. So if you are going to teach the language function, compare and contrast. So for the vocabulary words, you can also teach both, also, and contrast. And then for the grammatical structure, you can teach either superlative, adjective, like the smallest, or comparative, adjective, like smaller. So as I will talk about language function more in a second. And now let's move on to the, the last tool, language scripts. And this is also very helpful. Language scripts are like uh, sentence starters or transition words. And later I will give you more examples about that. Don't worry about it. So according to Cloud, she made this table and uh, she also mentioned the amount and sophistication of oral language a language you, a language learner can produce may vary depending on their proficiency level. So when students are at different level, they can perform certain kinds of um, language function and it depends on their proficiency level. So she listed for beginner, these are the language function you can expect your students to do. And for advanced students, they can do more advanced language functions. So now let's move on to the language scripts. So language scripts, as I mentioned, they are like uh, some of them are sentence starters, and it is very helpful if you can use this in your class. Because for language learners, they need to be able to use uh, English appropriately. So let me give you the example. So let's take a look at the third one. So when the student, when a student doesn't agree with someone, so probably because he or she is a beginner or intermediate student, so he or she may say, I don't agree with you. I think you are wrong. So actually this is not very appropriate to say that. So a better way is that we can show them they can, when they disagree with someone, they can say, I see your point, but what about? So you will see when you teach the language scripts, actually you are helping your students to use language more appropriately in different kinds of situations. And now let's move on to the, and let me show you how I use this language tools. But for me, I like to put the language starters on a poster or on language scripts, and then I put them on the wall. So when my students are doing a discussion and they are all stuck and they don't know how to start a conversation, then they can just check the wall very quickly and they can be able to start a conversation. Now I want to move on to the next one. So in addition to sentence starters, 
we can also teach them transition words. So for different language functions, they come with different transition words. So I also like to put them on the poster. Another way is that I like to put the transition words on handouts. So students can have the handouts with them and it's very easy for them to check. So they will have always have the handouts with them. So when they are stuck or they can just check it very quickly, then they will be able to jump in the discussion. So let me share you like this one. So did you see, okay. Did you see there are many kinds of language function? And for each language function, there are different kinds of transition words that students will know what kind of transition words they can use. Okay, so now let's move on to the next one. So then how can we teach students these language daughters or transition words? You can either consider using a systematic approach or wait for a teachable, teachable moment. But personally, I prefer to use a systematic approach because when I plan the lesson, I want to know like for the next week, which language function are we going to work on? So for the next week, we're going to focus on that and keep practicing that language function to make sure my students are able to use them. So when I teach the sentence starters or transition words, I always follow three steps. The first step is that I explain to them that the language starters and the sentence start, the sentence starters and the transition word, what kind of language function do they serve? So after I exp explain to them, and then I will model how to use these language tools. I will either model them in a more explicit way or implicit way. And then I will have my students to practice using these discussion tools. So when I hear my students use these language tools, I will acknowledge their effort. When we acknowledge students' effort, students will be motivated to try to use this language more in their conversation. Okay, so this is how I teach my students with the discussion tools. Now let's move on to the, the last challenge the discussion expectation. So remember the story that I mentioned about my lovely Japanese students? So after that, in the beginning of every semester, I always show students this poster. And we will go through each expectation together. I will explain to them. So for example, I will ask them, you need to listen actively. So then you will be able to build on uh, what others say and also I don't know whether it happens in your class or not, but it happens to me that some of my students pretend, pretended that they understand, but actually they didn't. So I told them, if you don't understand me, please ask for clarification. It is okay to ask for clarification. And also um, in my class, I did a lot of debates. So I like my students to cite the text evidence. So I always say, give me text evidence. So I encourage them to go back to the reading and to find the text evidence to support their ideas. And then I don't know whether this happens to you or not, but this happened a lot to, to me. So especially my, uh, my teenager students, like I don't know why when they talk to each other, they don't look at each other and they look at me instead. And so I told them, when you talk to each other, you need to look at each other and don't just talk to teacher and or don't just talk to me. And also for some students, they love to share in the class, but sometimes they may, they may just take too much time to do that. So I will remind them, you need to monitor your speaking time so we can also hear from others. So these are my discussion expectation. You can uh, consider to use them or you can come up with your own. So now let's summarize what are the challenges that our students may have when they try to express themselves in English and what are the solutions. So remember the first one, one of the challenges that our students may not have enough background knowledge so if we use a flip learning approach, so they are prepared before coming to the class, so they will be able to share 
because they have some background knowledge. And then moving on, moving to the second challenge, the students uh, don't understand what is being said to them. So we need to make sure the input is comprehensible, is understandable. So I suggest you can use visual scaffolds to help them, such as uh, realia, pictures, or um, graphic organizers. And as for the discussion tools, students may not have enough vocabulary or phrasing to express their ideas, so you can offer them with some tools. Remember I shared about the sentence starters and the transition words, and also we used a tool to, work, to build on their vocabulary and grammar knowledge. And then a lot of you mentioned this one. Students may feel insecure to share their ideas, so make sure you create a welcoming and encouraging environment. And lastly, make sure you go through each expectation in the beginning of the semester so the students will know what do you expect them to do when they are in a discussion. So after we deal with all the challenges, finally, our students are ready to participate in the discussion. But we need to be careful about the questions we ask them. Remember in the beginning of my presentation, if we only ask students non-answer questions, then students cannot produce complex language and also they cannot think deeply enough. So I would encourage you to ask your students more open-ended questions. And however, even we ask students a lot of open-ended questions, some students still try to hide from them. They don't want to share their ideas in the class. Then how can we deal with that? So I will suggest you can design some discussion activity to help them to participate in the discussions. So let's start with the open-ended questions first. So remember, I had my students watch a TED Talk, right? So I use this that classroom presentation tool. So for each TED Talk, it has about 12 questions. So I went to the tool and tried to find interesting questions for my students. So if you are interested, you are more than welcome to check this tool. And as so now let's move on to the discussion activity. So you may start to wonder how to design an effective discussion activity. So let's do a poll to find out the answers, okay? So what is the most important criterion for well-designed speaking text? So I gave you four choices. Could you please choose one? And Anders, we may need your help with the poll. So could you please help us with that? So everyone take a look at these four criteria and click on the, the one that you think is the most important one. Interesting, I see a lot of you chose number four and some of you chose number one and two. And one, one of you cho chose number three. Interesting. So we have five more seconds to do that. So please share your ideas with me. I'm very excited to know your ideas and your thoughts about this. Okay, so uh, because of time constraints. So Anders, could you please help us to close this poll and let's, let's take a look at the results. Great. So a lot of you chose number four. And uh, so for me, and uh, some of you type in the chat box, a combination of all, I agree with you. So these are all very important criteria you need to take into consideration when you design a speaking activity. So you need to make sure that there is a need to talk so students would actually participate in the discussion. And also, we need to make sure the language is used for authentic purpose because after students leave the classroom, we would want them to be able to use English in the real world, right? So this is important for our students. 
The third one is that, actually, I, I like this one a lot, but only four of you chose this one. And so we need to try to push our students out of their comfort zone. Because if we don't do that, then our students won't, won't produce complex language. So they, they need to start to try to use stretches of language. So by practicing doing that, they will be able to produce complex language better. And the number four is one of the text should be engaging and relevant. So when that happens, students are more willing to and more interested in participating in the discussion. And also there are still there are still another three important criteria that you need to take into consideration when you design a speaking activity. So for number five is that you need to make sure it include all those members. Don't leave anyone behind. So make sure you include everyone, even they are beginners. And the sixth one is also the very important one. You need to try to build an information gap for this activity. So the student need to negotiate and need to discuss to find out the missing information. And the last one is that there there is a clear outcome for the activity. So students will know what do you exactly want them to do, whether you want them to solve a problem or whether you want them to share information. So now I'm going to share three activities. Uh, uh, they are not only very engaging, but they also include all the seven criteria. So let's take a look at the first one. And I got these ideas from Gibbon's book. So let's take a look at the first one. The first one is called picture sequencing. So remember that I had my students watch a TED Talk, right? So after watching the TED Talk, and then I screenshotted the key moment of the TED Talk. And then I randomly assigned each picture card to a student. Then the students couldn't show the cards to their groupmates. Next, they needed to discuss with their group mate and describe their, their picture cards. And then they work as a whole group to find out the sequence of the TED Talk. And finally, they summarize in their oral language about this TED Talk. So now let me show you another activity. It is called picture sentence matching. And this activity is fun and it's also is great for the beginner students. So for student A, you will give them picture cards. For student B, you give them sentences. And they cannot show their cards to their partner. Then student A start to describe the picture to student B and student B need to base on these information and then find the sentence that can match to the picture. However, if student A didn't describe the picture very clearly, then student B cannot find the sentence to match the picture. Then student A need to try to describe again. So did you see this is a great activity to help them to practice their language? Then let's move on to the last activity. I also like this activity a lot. It is called inquiry and elimination. So for student A, she can choose any picture cards that he wants. And then he can, she cannot show the card to her groupmates. So for the rest of the student, they need to work together and take turns asking her questions to find out what picture card she has. And when the student asks her a question, student A can only answer yes or no. And the interesting part is that you can limit the number of questions students can ask. So for me, I want to make it more challenging. So I, I only allowed my students to ask three questions. The reason why I do that is that I want them to practice their logic. So they need to think very critically and I try to avoid random questioning. So they will start, they need to start with a broad question and then narrow down to other questions to find out the answers. So I have finished discussing 
how to implement the third, third step, and also finish discussing all the main points for today's presentation. Now I want to move on to the last step, feedback. And I want to use a cartoon to help you to think about what would be a good way to give corrective feedback. So did you see the boy? He is a language learner and he was very excited about sharing his experience with his teacher. So he said, yesterday I go at the zoo. And the teacher said, you went to the zoo. It was gooder than anything. The teacher said, it was better than anything. Yeah, I go to the zoo. The teacher said, you went to the zoo. Yeah, I go to... The teacher said, you went. Yeah, not yet, it's yes. So did you see what I'm trying to show you? So what the, so in the beginning, this, the young boy was very excited. And even though she, he made it the grammatical mistake, so the teacher tried to help him. However, the students started to get very disappointed and even frustrated because he think that the teacher didn't pay attention to the content he tried to share. So even though it is very important when we give correct feedback, we need to focus on form to make sure we, our students produce language with accuracy. However, it is also very important to focus on meaning. So students, so make sure you don't just focus on form, but also focus on meaning. So here comes to the end of my presentation. So let me recap what we have been discussed for today's presentation. So for the first main point is that we talk about what a flipped learning approach is. So remember that for a flipped learning approach before coming to the class, students need to prepare for the class. They can either watch the video or do a reading. So by doing that, we are helping them to take more responsibility of their own learning and also shift their roles from a passive learner to an active learner. And so for the class time, the teacher would have more time to do discussion or higher order thinking activities. Then by doing so, the teachers are helping students to deepen their learning. And we will also talk about how to implement this approach. So remember that there are four steps to do that. And uh, I use my class as an example. So when they do self-study, I use a tactile for them so they can prepare before the class. And after that, they use this app, uh, Learn English with Tactile, to do some online practice. So after that, they, are, they will prepare for the class. And then for the in-class activities, we also use this tool to work on to work on their, uh, so they will be able to answer some open-ended questions. And lastly, I give them feedback. And remember, don't just focus on form, we also need to focus on meaning. So give them the feedback, feedback based on their performance uh, for their in-class activities. And we also talk about the second and the third one. So what are, we mentioned about the challenges that students may have when they try to express themselves. And remember, there are five challenges, and I also offer you uh, five solutions to deal with these challenges, such as provide them uh, discussion tools, center starters, transition words, and also tell them the discussion expectation, provide them with comprehensible input, try to build the background knowledge, and build the encourage environment. And lastly, for the last one, I also share with you how to design engaging speaking activities. So remember, there are seven criteria that you need to consider when you, when you want to design an effective speaking activity. And I also gave you three examples that uh, they, they were designed based on these seven criteria. So I hope you find today's presentation as informative and helpful and helpful, and you may want to try to use this approach in your class. So if you have any questions, please feel free and type your questions in the chat box. I'll be more than happy to share, uh, to answer your questions.
Thank you, everyone. Can you hear me? Hello. Yeah. Ping, I have a question that I noticed in the chat window while you were presenting today. Um, there were many questions about um, the class you teach, how many students are in that class, and if you have any thoughts on applying these strategies to uh, larger class sizes. So it depends on how large. Uh, so actually, with learning approach, it can either be used for small small sizes or large classes or, or a large class. So for me, I teach a class of 25 students. So when we do that, I will divide them into small groups. So remember that for the third step, they will do some in-class activities. So they can do that in a small group. So let's go back to this one. So no matter whether you are teaching a large class or a small class, you can still implement this approach. Because if it's a large class, make sure you divide them into small groups and to do the activity that you assign them. And you are going to circulate in the class and try to facilitate uh, their discussion or help them to do these activities. But when you do the small group, you need to assign roles for each student. Mm -hmm. So they will be on task. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Great, thank you. No problem, my pleasure. So I use some one of you mentioned that when you do, when you have them do small group discussion, they start to use their L1. Yeah, that is true. So that's why the discussion expectation is very important. In the beginning of that, and they need to tell them, they need to know what you expect them. So even for the, uh, so make sure they know they shouldn't use their L1. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Okay, I hope thank you, you enjoyed today's thank presentation. Um, My pleasure. We wrap up for today, before we wrap up for today, I just want to mention a couple of things. The first is that the examples you saw today were from a brand new resource from National Geographic Learning called Learn English with TED Talks. This is a student app, but also a set of classroom resources to allow you to bring TED Talks into any classroom, no matter how much time you have. Uh, the proficiency level of your students, the goals of your classroom. So if you're interested in learning more about this resource, at the end of today's session, once you fill out the survey, you'll be directed to a website where you can request a demo. Emily has just posted that uh, link to the chat box, so be sure to visit there. In addition, if you enjoyed today's webinar, I'd like to invite you to go to our webinars homepage at eltngl.com slash webinars where you can learn about upcoming webinars that we'll be having for adult learners, teens, and young learners. You can also subscribe there so you never miss uh, any of the future webinars we'll be hosting. I'd also like to invite you to subscribe to our In Focus blog at eltngl.com slash In Focus, uh, where we post regularly with more teaching tips for the ELT classroom. And just one more time as a reminder, we will be emailing you all a certificate of attendance the um, slides from today's presentation and a recording of this session in the next few days, approximately five days from now. So I'd like to thank you one more time. When we leave the meeting room today, you'll be invited to complete that survey. And just once more, I'd like to thank you for participating in today's session, and we hope to see you at more of our events and also on our social media pages on Facebook and LinkedIn. So if you're not already, please join uh, our community of educators in those locations because we will be posting lots of uh, great information and updates on future events there. Thank you again and have a wonderful day or wonderful evening. And thank you, Ping, for your wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you so much for joining today's presentation. And remember to check the in focus because I wrote the article about flip learning, okay? Perfect. Thank you so much. Perfect. Thank you. Bye, everyone.